On the 14th of October in 1066, the Battle of Hastings took place. This is a conflict which changed the world and influenced civilizations for hundreds of years to come. It is a battle which is renowned and celebrated in Britain. Details of the battle are taught in primary schools and the date is ingrained into many Britain's memory even if it's because of a catchy insurance company advert named after the battle. At the time of recording it has been 955 years since the Battle of Hastings and to celebrate this we wanted to take a deep dive into the battle and explore the events leading up to it. Hi, I'm Josh. And I'm Dave of Nerd and Dragon, and today we are taking a deep dive into the Battle of Hastings. Prior to examining the events of the Battle of Hastings, we need to explore how we and historians know this information. There are many articles, books, videos and TV shows which detail the happening of the Battle of Hastings. However, most are derived from two main sources, the Bayer Tapestry and the chronicler William of Poitiers. The Bayer Tapestry created a visual depiction of the sequence of events from 1064 up until the end of the battle. It is believed that the tapestry was produced shortly after the Norman conquest for William's half-brother, Bishop Odo of Bayer, who is featured heavily in the tapestry. Poitiers was a Norman soldier and later became King William I's chaplain. He wrote the deeds of William, Duke of the Normans and King of England in what is speculated to be 1071. Poitiers himself did not fight at Hastings, although he clearly took the time to question those who did. One does have to take these sources with a pinch of salt, as both are from a Norman viewpoint. However, the two sources provide more information than historians have for any other medieval battle. On the 5th of January 1066, the King of England, Edward the Confessor, died, beginning the disputed claims for succession that would eventually conclude with the Battle of Hastings. There were many people who believed they had claims to the throne, but the two with the strongest claims were Harold Godwinson and William, the Duke of Normandy. In order to fully understand the claims of both men, we believe it is critical to understand who they were and why they thought their claims to the throne were just. Harold Godwinson Harold was the son of Godwin, the Earl of Wessex and Kent, and Gyther, who belonged to a prosperous Danish noble family, with a deep connection to King Canute, the King of Norway. Harold's father was a hugely influential and powerful figure in the kingdom early into Edward the Confessor's reign. It is believed that he was more influential than the king himself. Edward was childless during his reign and as such named Godwin his successor. In 1044, Harold's father persuaded the king to bequeath Harold earldoms for East Anglia, Essex, Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire, further solidifying his influence by organising for his daughter Edith to marry the king. However, in 1051, Godwin refused a royal command to punish the occupants of Dover, who had defied a Norman lord. By this time, it is speculated that Edward wanted to diminish Godwin's influence at court, enabling him to fill his court with Norman lords. As a result of his defiance, the king amassed his forces and sent them to capture Godwin and Harold. Godwin mustered his men and was prepared to fight the king. However, his rebellion collapsed when Edward persuaded powerful nobles to support him. Godwin and Harold were banished for defying royal command. After these events, Edward named William, the Duke of Normandy, his heir. Edward had spent time in Normandy during his exile between 1016 and 1041. By 1052, Edward's pro-Norman politics created unrest throughout the country. Capitalising on this, Harold mustered his forces and that of fellow nobles and invaded England. Harold would go on to be successful in his invasion and force the king to restore his father to his previous positions. Godwin died in 1052, resulting in Harold succeeding his father's earldoms and titles. Like his father, Harold was considered one of the most powerful and influential people in the kingdom. This influence was extended by the death of Leofric, the Earl of Mercia, who had long been one of his father's and his biggest rivals. During this period, Harold used his power to secure earldoms for his three brothers, Tostig, Gerth and Leofwin. Throughout this period, Harold proved to be an excellent diplomat and developed excellent relationships with leading clerics throughout the kingdom, including the Bishop of Winchester and Archbishop of Canterbury. Harold faced opposition to his control throughout his earldom, most notably from Alfgar, the son and heir of Leofric of Mercia. Alfgar had persuaded a leading Welsh prince to help him in the raiding of Mercia. However, Harold proved to be an excellent military commander, squashing the rebellion 
and in turn subjugating Wales. Two years later, Harold would face another challenge when his brother, Tostig, would be ousted as the Earl of Northumbria and forced to accept Morcar, a descendant of Leothric of Mercia. Sensing that his power could be challenged, he abandoned his brother and married Morcar's sister, which strengthened his position with the Mercians and the Welsh. Tostig fled to Flanders and began plotting how to take revenge on his brother for abandoning him in his time of need. Although not known at the time, Tostig's plans could have been a contributing factor into Harold's loss at the Battle of Hastings. With his earldom restored, securing more power through the late 1050s and 60s, and becoming a dominant figure at court, it is likely that Harold believed that he would ascend to the throne following the death of Edward the Confessor. William, the Duke of Normandy William was the eldest of two children born to Robert I of Normandy and his concubine Herleva. Shortly after William's birth, his mother would be married to Herlewin, the Viscount of Conteville, whom she had two further children with, Odo, the future Bishop of Bayeux, and an unnamed daughter. In 1035, William's father died whilst returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, resulting in William, his only son and nominated heir, becoming Duke of Normandy. William faced many troubles growing up. His legitimate birth was a point of contention for nobles, and the fact that he acceded as a child angered them more. Throughout this time is when William was given the name William the Bastard, which would be used throughout his life. Whilst growing up, three of William's guardians died violent deaths, and his tutor was also murdered. Oftentimes, it seemed as if anything would be done to stop the Duke continuing to rule. His father's kin and noblemen often refused to help William and turned a blind eye to many of these events, as they believed they would have more to gain in the event of his death. Growing up in this environment is likely what helped William to develop his strong morals and personal drive. In 1042, on his 15th birthday, the young William was knighted and began to help govern his duchy. His knighthood did not stop the opposition to William's title though. Between 1046 and 1055, William had to overcome baronial rebellions, which were mostly led by his own kinsmen. During these rebellions, William had to rely on King Henry of France for help. However, it is believed dealing with these uprisings is what taught William how to fight and lead an army. It is noted that William first displayed his prowess as a warrior in 1047 when Henry and William defeated a coalition of Norman rebels at Valles Dune, southeast of Cannes. After 1047, William began to participate in events outside of his duchy. In support of King Henry, and in an attempt to strengthen his southern frontier and expand into the western county of Maine, he fought a series of campaigns against Geoffrey Martel, the Count of Anjou. But between 1052, when Henry and Geoffrey made peace, and a serious rebellion began in eastern Normandy, until 1054, William again was in grave danger. During this period, he conducted important negotiations with his cousin, Edward the Confessor, King of England, in which he was named the heir to the English throne and took a wife. William had lent support to his cousin during his exile in Normandy, and it was clear that William expected something in return for his help. It is thought that upon William having ambitions to become the next King of England, Edward began encouraging him. Between 1054 and 1060, William having been named heir to the throne of England, set out to become the most powerful ruler in northern France. He was victorious in two key battles at Mortimer in 1054 and Varaville in 1057, where he quelled rebellions of King Henry and Geoffrey Martel. After these victories, his position would be further strengthened by the deaths of Henry and Geoffrey in 1060, who were succeeded by weaker rulers. In 1063, William conquered Maine, achieving his ambition to become the most powerful ruler in northern France. He continued to govern and prepared for his ascension to the English throne. Why were the claims disputed? In 1064 or 1065, the Bio Tapestry depicts Harold swearing fealty to William and promising to support his claim to the throne. This is believed to be part of an embassy mission Edward sent Harold on to confirm William as successor to the throne. The tapestry goes on to show that William took Harold on a campaign to Brittany, and during this period, Harold swore a renewed oath and promised to support William's ascension. On January the 5th, 1066, King Edward the Confessor died. It was said that on his deathbed, he entrusted his kingdom to Harold. Harold ascends. The day after the king's death, Harold was elected king by the Wittingamot of England. On January the 6th, 1066, Harold Godwinson was crowned King Harold II of England. 
although not known at the time, Harold would be the last Anglo-Saxon king. His reign was immediately threatened by William, Harold Hardrada, the king of Norway, and by his brother Tostig. Upon his ascension to the throne, Harold mobilised his fleet and peasant army of the south to guard the coast against the expected invasion by William. Whilst preparing for the Norman invasion, Harold's brother and Harold III began raids along the southern and eastern coasts, forcing Harold to divide his forces to repel these raids. In September of 1066, Harold III and Tostig invaded the north of England and defeated an army at Gate Fulford. In response to this, Harold mustered his men and marched to the invaders. On September the 25th, 1066, Harold's Anglo-Saxon army met the invading Viking King army led by Carold Hardrada and Harold's own brother Tostig at Stamford Bridge in what would become known as the Battle of Stamford Bridge. It was a bloody battle where around 12,000 English soldiers surprised 6,000 Vikings camping on both sides of the River Derwent. The Vikings had left most of their armour and around 3,000 warriors at their ships a fair distance away, which put them at a disadvantage. The majority of Vikings camping on the west side of the river were slain quickly, with the survivors retreating to the east side. However, the English advance to the eastern side was delayed as they had to pass through a narrow bridge. Not only was the bridge narrow, but the English also had to deal with a giant axe-wheeling Viking blocking the bridge. This warrior single-handedly held up the English army, slaying numerous Englishmen in the process and was defeated only when the English floated under the bridge, thrusting spears up through the planks into his legs and groin, eventually mortally wounded him. Due to the English being held for so long at the bridge, the Vikings on the east side of the river had time to form a shield wall to face the Saxon onslaught. The English eventually broke the Viking shield wall after a few hours of hard fighting and then outflanked them. Viking king Harold Hardrada suffered an arrow to his throat soon after and died. The leaderless Vikings were eventually reinforced by the 3,000 warriors who had been with the boats. Now, fully armed for battle, they put up a decent fight, almost swaying the tide, but were eventually soundly defeated. The English suffered 5,000 casualties and the Vikings around 6,000. The battlefield is said to have been littered with bleached bones for up to 50 years after the battle. The Viking defeat at Stamford Bridge was the last great attack on England. William secures Cassus Belly from the Pope. Upon Harold being declared King of England, William decided on war. However, he was patient and carefully planned his invasion. His first steps were to secure international support for his invasion. He took counsel with influential nobles and appointed key supporters to his ducal administration. During this time, William sought Pope Alexander II, citing conquest as his casus belli, to which the Pope gave his blessing. In addition to receiving the Pope's blessing and international support, William appealed to volunteers to join his invasion of England, to which hundreds replied. Numerous recruits were even from outside of Normandy. With the Vikings invading England prior to him, William was cautious in approach, but by August had gathered his army and fleet at the mouth of the River Deves. William's fleet was plagued by adverse winds, resulting in losses to his men and fleet which demoralised the troops greatly. However, these events would work to William's benefit. On the 8th of September, King Harold II was forced to release the peasant army he had summoned to defend the southern and eastern coast due to a lack of resources. After the wind subsiding and a troubled trip, William eventually landed in England. His army immediately took the unresisting towns of Pevensey and Hastings, where he began organising his forces. It is believed William had mustered seven to 12,000 cavalry and infantry, but the exact size of his army is unknown. Harold, having just repelled the Viking invasion, immediately marched southward upon learning of the Norman army landing. It is believed that Harold had his men march with haste, reaching London on October the 6th where his men, exhausted from battle and marching, rested for a few days prior to them marching to meet the Norman forces. During this time, the chronicler William of Poitiers documented that Harold, shortly before the Battle of Hastings, sent William an emissary who admitted that Edward had promised the throne to William, but argued that this was overridden by his deathbed promise to Harold. In reply, William did not dispute the deathbed promise, but argued that Edward's prior promise to him 
took precedence. The Battle of Hastings On the 13th of October, 1066, Harold's Anglo-Saxon army arrived in a forest seven miles north of Hastings, where the present-day town of Battle is located. Harold's forces arrived too late in the day to make an advancement to the Norman army, so took a defensive position and made camp for the evening. Early the next day, speculated to be 9am, before Harold could prepare his exhausted troops for battle, William's Norman army charged, beginning the Battle of Hastings. Historians believe that Harold's forces were deployed in a small, defensive formation at the top of a steep slope with the flanks protected by woodland and marshy ground. The battle is said to have opened with the Norman archers shooting uphill at the English soldiers, with little to no effect thanks to the shield wall formed. After this, William sent spearmen and when they struggled against the English shield wall, ordered his cavalry to support his men. The phalanx of the Saxon army held firm against the Norman charge of cavalry and volley of arrows. The steadfastness of the English lines caused chaos for the Norman army. The chaos caused William's cavalry to retreat. According to Robert Wace, the medieval poet, Harold commanded his men to stay in formation. However, his infantry, overconfident at their enemy retreating, abandoned the defensive position and began pursuing them. This would be their undoing. William, seeing his cavalry retreat, charged forwards and rallied his men, turning them around and decimating the unorganised infantry. Acknowledging this flaw in the exhausted and disorganised Anglo-Saxon army, William would command his men to use this tactic a further two times. The exact number of the opposing armies is unknown, as is the deaths. However, it is speculated that Harold had a fighting force of 5,000 to 13,000 men, with William having 7,000 to 12,000. The battle raged all day. As dusk was rapidly approaching, Harold II, King of England, would be killed. His brothers, Gerth and Leofwine, were also killed. William of Poitiers claimed that Gerth's and Leofwine's bodies were found close to Harold, meaning they likely fought with him to the end. With the king and his brothers dead, the English forces were leaderless and began to collapse. Many soldiers fled and were charged down by the Norman cavalry and it is believed that members of the royal household stayed with Harold's body and fought until their deaths. Harold's death has lived in infamy in English history as he was said to have died from an arrow to the eye. Whilst many historians now believe that this is the case, there is very little evidence to support this. William of Poitiers simply stated that Harold died without giving the details of the nature of his death. The belief that he was shot in the eye comes from the Bayou Tapestry, which depicts two bodies on the floor, one with an arrow through the eye and the other being struck with the sword. The text accompanying this depiction simply says, Here, Harold has been killed. It doesn't state which is King Harold and almost would have certainly boosted the infamy of William to let people think that Harold had died from an arrow to the eye. After the Battle of Hastings, William quickly moved to quash rebellion centres that may have opposed his invasion and preventing a new leader from appearing. Upon quelling these rebellions, William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, was crowned King of England on Christmas Day, 1066. He became William I of England and commonly referred to as William the Conqueror in later years. Legacy William was already an experienced ruler. The Norman church flourished under his reign as he adapted its structures to English traditions. Like many contemporary rulers, he wanted the church in England to be free of corruption, but also subordinate to him. Thus, he condemned simony and disapproved of clerical marriage. He would not tolerate opposition from bishops or abbots or interference from the papacy, but he remained on good terms with Popes Alexander II and Gregory VII, though tensions arose on occasions. William became disinterested in living in England by the end of 1067 and returned to Normandy, but was forced to return and deal with rebellions that began that year which reached their peak in 1069, when William resorted to such violent measures that even contemporaries were shocked. To secure his hold on the country, he introduced the Norman practice of building castles, including the Tower of London. By 1071 the rebellions were eradicated, completing the ruin of the English higher aristocracy and secured its replacement by an aristocracy of Norman lords who introduced patterns of land holding and military service that had been developed in Normandy. To secure England's borders, William would invade Scotland in 1072 and Wales in 1081, creating special counties as defensive borders. 
William left a profound mark on both Normandy and England and is one of the most important figures in medieval English history. His personal resolve and good fortune allowed him to survive the anarchy of Normandy in his youth and gradually transformed the duchy into the leading political and military power of northern France. His support for monastic reform and improved episcopal organisation earned him respect from church leaders and further strengthened his hand on the duchy. His conquest of England in 1066 altered the course of English history. Even though he adopted a number of Anglo-Saxon institutions and continued various social and economic trends that he had begun before 1066, the English church was Normanized by William and brought more fully into line with developments on the continent. William also imposed a new aristocracy of, on England that was French in language and culture. English language, literature, art, architecture were transformed because of William's conquest. The new king and his nobility were also very much involved with affairs in Normandy and France, and therefore the orientation of the English royal policy shifted towards continental affairs. New forms of land tenure and military service were established after the conquest, and castles dotted the landscape as a symbol of the new regime. As conqueror and king, William significantly shaped the history of England. Josh here, we really enjoyed researching and making this video and hope you enjoyed it. We're planning on releasing regular videos at various points in history and hope you can support us. Liking and subscribing helps us out a ton. Feel free to leave us a comment below and let us know what you would like to see our video on. Thank you for watching.